Uh, we shall now go on to our next speaker, Dr. Anand Nayak, who's a senior resident in glaucoma cataract and cornea services at RP Center. And uh, he's going to be telling us that some uh, very important, uh, not a common complication, uh, supracoroidal hemorrhage. On to you, Dr. Yes, uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, first of all, I thank uh, AOS team for giving me this opportunity among glaucoma legends. and. And my special thank to my uh, guide and mentor, uh, Professor Tanuj sir, for giving this opportunity. And coming to today's topic that uh, supracoroidal hemorrhage is one of the uh, deadliest nightmare complication for ophthalmic surgeons. And today we will try to learn how to minimize this complication and preserve good vision. And uh, so I will explain uh, this uh, process in parallel with the case scenario, uh, which has happened with uh, one of my cases. And uh, he's uh, one 15 year old male uh, who, who is uh, diagnosed late onset primary congenital glaucoma at two years of age and operated for uh, both eye trabeculotomy and trabeculectomy. Later, he presented with one eye uh, as one eye. Now, his systemic uh, his factors are he, he was deaf and dumb and unable to follow the commands properly. And ocular cyst factors will be like uh, he's already uh, he was previously operated for trab and trab and he, he was highly myopic of minus eight diopters spherical and uh, high paraoperative IOP of 42 mm of AC. So now uh, later he planned for uh, tree trabeculectomy with 0.4 percent uh, mitomycin C under explained visual prognosis. This is a short clip of uh, tree trabeculectomy with mitomycin C. Uh, so, traction suture applied and uh, phonics based conjunctival peritomy done and uh, thorough cauterization and scleral bed prepared and scleral flap prepared and mitomycin C 0.4% applied. And then uh, uh, thorough wash given and anterior chamber paracentesis done and anterior chamber uh, formed with uh, after injecting air and uh, scleral ostium made and surgical iridectomy performed. And then uh, scleral flap closed with uh, tenjuro monofilament nylon on the, both the corners. And then, uh, then the peritomy is closed with tenjuro vicryl in a double row fashion. And uh, later, uh, here in this case, one point we lack is uh, uh, we uh, didn't put the releasable sutures. So keep in mind uh, that is one learning point uh, from this case after operating and post-op day one, anterior chamber and blebber uh, are uh, well formed and IOP is 12 mm of AG. After five hours, uh, the patient got discharged and he uh, again presented with intense pain in that operated eye. On examination, flat anterior chamber was there with loss of fundus flow. And on ultrasonography, see, uh, there is choroidal detachment, which is uh, kissing in nature and uh, with uh, severe uh, mild to moderate internal reflectivity on uh, scan, And this is the CP of the same eye, same operated eye. See on uh, examination, the one side he got uh, serous choroidal detachment and others, other side uh, he got uh, hemorrhagic choroidal uh, and both are kissing each other. And this is the opto CP of the same patient and same eye. So coming to the risk factors which uh, are responsible for delayed supracoroidal hemorrhage for uh, glaucoma drainage devices are most commonly associated with supracoroidal hemorrhage then the only trabeculectomy and low post-operative IOP less than 3 mm of AC is the one most common uh, risk factor and aphakic patients and uh, other risk factors will be if I already previously operated and uh, known hypertensive patients ischemic heart disease patients are much more uh, risk for developing supracoroidal hemorrhage and uh, never forget to put releasable sutures in such uh, high risk patients. And so if supracoroidal hemorrhage uh, happens in intraoperative period with signs of uh, rise in IOP, change in uh, red reflex and vitreous prolapse would be there, then in such instances, uh, you have to prompt closure of the surgical site is mandatory. And in case of trabeculectomy, closure of the uh, surgical ostium is needed. So after that, if uh, IOP has increased, then should be managed with topical and oral IOP levering agents. If uh, in such cases, good visual uh, recovery should be expected. And if supracoroidal hem uh, hemorrhage happens in post-operative period uh, with signs of, like in this case also, intensive pain will be there. 
on change in red reflex, a low, very low IOP and decrease in vision. Always lit lamp examination and indirect in uh, ophthalmoscopy helpful uh, for confirming the diagnosis. And ultrasonography always helpful in localizing and marking the extent of suprachoroidal hemorrhage. And it also helps in assessing the clot uh, lysis during the follow-up and uh, with the evidence of uh, decreasing internal reflectivity of the choroidal detachment. So these are the two ultrasonographic features uh, to differentiate uh, for clotted blood and lysed blood. One is show, uh, the first one is showing with high internal reflectivities uh, in the on USG, which is showing of clotted blood and it is difficult to drain. The other one is showing mild to moderate, uh, very low inter, uh, internal reflectivity, suggestive of lysed blood, which is easily uh, drainable supracoronal hemorrhage. So for that, surgical approaches will be like uh, once uh, there will be absence of vitro retinal traction or no retinal attachment, then only external drainage alone is sufficient. And if there is presence of retinal detachment or vitro retinal traction or vitreous hemorrhage or associated any dislocated lens fragments, then in such instances, vitro retinal surgery along with external drainage should be needed. So this is the uh, short clip of uh, supracoronal drainage of the same patient as explained earlier. So anterior chamber entry made and then uh, anterior chamber uh, maintainer placed to maintain the AC fluctuations. And later uh, with 23 gauge trocar in an inclined fashion, uh, inserted in the supracoroidal space and we try to drain the supracoroidal fluid. See here the blood is oozing out, hemorrhagic uh, blood from the supracoroidal space and it is uh, as much as uh, uh, the removal fluid is removed and then trocar uh, expel and then the anterior chamber is uh, secured with uh, tenjiro monofilament nylon suture and the AC uh, formed with tensely to Rise the IOP with uh, healer. So on uh, day three post-op, the uh, AC and anterior chamber and blood were very well formed and IOP is 8 mm of AC. Fundal glow improved uh, really well from the day one post-op. And ultrasonography on day one, kissing corals was there. And uh, it is uh, after surgery, it improved to single dome-shaped coral detachment. On day five, the dome-shaped uh, coralid detachment was remnant and we planned for re-suturing of the filtering blood. So this is the short video showing re-suturing of the filtering blood. So same patient and uh, we uh, traction suture applied and bleb, filtering blood is explored and the uh, both filtering areas, leaking areas is identified and the, both the sides of the bleb. And then uh, we secured those leaking areas with tenjiro monofilament nylon. And later, the uh, peritomy is closed with 80 uh, white blood cells. And then uh, we uh, given a uh, uh, little bit of uh, steroids and oral steroids. And on day eight, uh, the fundal glow is really well improved. And on USG, only there, there was inferonasal uh, coralid detachment uh, was there. And uh, later, the patient presented at three months post-op with well-settled choroidals and uh, he got vision of 636 and uh, with IOP of 20 mm of AG and maximal topical medication. And so, so the factors which are associated with surgically poor visual outcomes are supracoidal hemorrhage with retinal detachment and 360 degree supracoidal hemorrhage. The, the factors which are with good visual recovery uh, will be like supracoronal hemorrhage without retinal detachment, supracoronal hemorrhage in one or two quadrants, or eyes which underwent surgical procedures for drainage of the supracoronal hemorrhage. So take home points will be like preoperatively if the patient uh, is high myopic, previously operated, affective patients and high preoperativity. In such instances, we have to reduce as much as pre-op uh, pre to target range and hypertension should be controlled and anticoagulants should be stopped. Intraoperatively, we have to keep in mind that ocular compression massages should be given to reduce the IOP and manital should be given to uh, reduce preoperative IOP uh, in a well-controlled manner. During surgery, AC paracentesis is mandatory as to reduce the uh, intraop fluctuations of IOP from high to very low. And pre-placed scleral sutures where uh, suturing the sclera and making the scleral ostium are really helpful to reduce the uh, large range of IOP fluctuations like very high to very low. 
and releasable sutures are always helpful during surgery and uh, post operative period also these are uh, like in our case also uh, the explained case scenario uh, lack of releasable sutures uh, we uh, had that supracranial hemorrhage and uh, tight scleral flap sutures are always helpful and longer duration of the intraocular surgery and conversion surgeries from take home education to uh, ECCE or SICS and PCR with vitreous loss are always risk factor for uh, developing supracranial hemorrhage. Be cautious in such instances uh, while managing. And postoperatively, severe hypotony and valsalva maneuvers are the most important risk factors. And we always uh, have to explain the patient that do not rub the eyes and uh, patching the eyes for at least one week postoperative time as most tricky surgery. Uh, trabeculectomy is very sensitive surgery, so I have to keep on explaining the patient that do not rub the eyes, night patching for at least one week, and uh, while traveling also he can patch. So uh, these are the uh, take-home notes. Thank you. Dr. Anand, that was an excellent talk. I mean, you, I think you left nothing uncovered. I would uh, uh, ask the expert panel to, you can you stop sharing your screen? Yes, thank you. Yes. I would want the expert panels to discuss this uh, very interesting case. Dr. Shishmita, would you take the questions? Yeah, so uh, one important thing, like Dr. Anand, lovely presentation and nice detailed uh, story of a very difficult uh, challenging yeah. patient. So uh, I think one of the uh, important things is to suspect it in top also, because uh, sometimes if you do take care to keep looking at the globe, you might have a change of glow under the microscope and that might give you a clue. But though you said that the patient came back to the ER, but uh, we're not sure whether the supracoroidal really would have started in the post-op period or uh, intraoperatively. The other thing is the feel during surgery. Sometimes you can f feel the eye getting a little firmer and an intraoperative mannitol maybe at that time might help also. But like he said, identifying the risk factors is very, very important. And the small eyes, the really hyperopic eyes when you're doing angle closure, uh, uh, surgery for angle closure, those are the ones which are both for malignant glaucoma as for supraglobality. But otherwise, I thought very well managed. And the most important thing is to wait for clot lysis. You know, as a young surgeon, you might be tempted to acha supraglobal hair, let's go in and take it out. You have to give that time of about two weeks usually wait for the lysis and only then if it is not settling then decide and i would always prefer a vr surgeon taking over rather than going in as an anterior second those would be my yes dr krishna das would you want to add something here yes dr chitra i think anand demonstrated a well managed patient with a ch but what our younger colleagues those in the audience need to know is how to avoid such a situation because management of these situations are going to be very difficult, especially for anterior segment surgeons, as Sushmita mentioned. And the outcomes are going to be much poorer if uh, uh, conditions like uh, SCH supervene. So the whole crux of the matter is how do we prevent them? How do we identify those eyes at risk, uh, at uh, uh, risk of uh, possible SCH, careful selection of the case, especially advanced glaucomas, and those eyes, uh, like high myopes, effects, and uh, angle closure glaucoma, which are at a higher risk. And all our efforts should be in preventing either prolonged intraoperative hypotony or uh, postoperative hypotony. All the measures which we take to ensure there is no prolonged hypotony, whether intraoperatively or in the postoperative phase, is going to prevent uh, such a complication. Um, in this context, I don't know whether it's truly in context, but this one question I have is, uh, what is the role of a decompressive vitrectomy in a phacomorphic glaucoma? This has been a, a question in my mind for a long time. There are a lot of cataract surgeons who talk about doing a decompressive vitrectomy in a case of a... So, Chitra, in uh, all our cases where we feel that despite manitol, the pressure is not adequately dropping down. And we have to go ahead and do a cataract surgery. We will definitely, and we are lucky to have the retina surgeons with us. So they will do that for us. 
and uh, many a times they'll just put in a uh, trocar and then if the vitreous is fluid it may just come out by itself instead of going in blindly doing a wet or maybe they just do a very small core wet and the the chamber also deepens off and you are operating on a softer eye which is which really is good only you want to take a question or shall we go to the next speaker yeah i had a question that uh, in yeah. patients with high risk of supracorneal hemorrhage where we tightly close down the scleral flap like stooge weber syndrome or uh, uh, you know that bad angle closure glaucoma uh, advanced angle closure glaucoma where you may be doing a fico trap uh, so uh, the conjunctiva is likely to scar down so any of uh, the panel members have any experience using some spacers like some people recommend injecting uh, helon over the flap to keep the conjunctiva away from till you remove the releasable suture So, Murli, I don't think, you know, if you inject helion under the bleb, so after 24 hours, it will all be gone. Yeah, so, yeah. it is not a long-term measure. We don't have here, but in Europe, there is one special HeLa flow implant, which can act as spacer, but that is not available here. So, I don't think helion can be used as spacer. The only important take-home message in this case, I just want to highlight, we had to go back and close the trabeclectomy. Because uh, the vitreoretinal surgeon drained and you were very happy day one and third post of day again kissing choroidal record. So unless you manage the hypotony and you close the trap, your supracordial hemorrhage drainage is not going to work. So that was a learning experience. And what mistake I did in this case was that I should have put in one eyed patient. I should have, it was under general anesthesia. So we should have given mannitol under general anesthesia. Secondly, end of surgery, I should have put some heel on and put additional releasable sutures. But sometimes you are overconfident and the, the case was very nicely formed. And when I saw in the morning, case was 10 pressure doing very well. So you become overconfident. And then one o'clock when you're having lunch, then casualty call that patient has come back with. So that was great learning experience. So never leave a one-eyed patient high myope in a low IOP state, put some heel on at the end of surgery, put releasable sutures, secure the wound at the end of closure. That is what we learned. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much uh, for those pearls.